All right, Jason, I think we are ready to to get going here. Talk to Simon a little bit. Talk to Simon, yeah. Simon, we have some questions for you before you get going. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we, we met Simon kind of in an interesting way, Brooke. Just to <laughs> did. Give him an, a little bit of an introduction, right? Um, yeah. It, it's, he just, we were, we were talking a little bit about um, some of the products from this company. You know what, Brooke? We didn't mention that today. Wallaby is one of our sponsors and oh, they true. offer prizes. We did not mention that today. Um, yeah, Simon showed up um, and spent some time talking with us and then came back and showed us how to use Wallaby, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, then he agreed to talk for us, but it's dangerous meeting us, right? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it was a lot of fun meeting Simon. Um, Definitely. So, and for anybody that kind of came in a little bit late, uh, and not late, but just after we had started, um, we had been talking with Simon and with Duncan. They're both from Australia. And so we'd been talking a little bit about life there in Australia, but I think, you know, along those lines, I'd love to know, Simon, if you had like a friend or family maybe who's never been to Australia come into town and you only were able to take them to do one thing there near where you live, what is that one thing that you would take and have them go do with you? Look, I, I think I'd probably take them up to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, it's, I think, a three or four hour flight. Um, it's not exactly local, but um, it's just amazing up there to go snorkeling and see all the fish and everything else. You, you've got to get a nice day for it. It can rain a lot up there, but um, that, that's that's pretty amazing. Great Barrier Reef. Nice. But so, there's there's so much there's so much in Australia I haven't even seen. Like I haven't been to Uluru, um, I haven't been to Tasmania. Like all those, like, it's such a big country. It's almost as big as the US. So there's so much to do. So are you a big scuba diver or snorkeler or both? No, I've got some asthma, so I was always told that I can't um, scuba dive, but uh, okay. snorkeling's fine and, and good fun. Cool. All right. Asthma part. What right? <laughs> yeah. We don't like that part. I've got I've got a little bit of asthma too. So, um, I'll, I'll, you know, Simon, one of we we like to ask some fun questions too. Um, and one of the ones that we like to ask every once in a while is, what was one of your favorite toys as a kid or while you were growing up? Look, it probably depends on on what age I was. I remember uh, maybe I was like 10 or 11. I had this double deck Sony portable uh, cassette uh, tape uh, machine. And, and that was my favorite toy for a while. And then I'd saved up my pocket money to buy a, a Sega Game Gear. And so mm. that was my favorite toy for a while. And then probably when I was about, I want to say 12 and a half or 13, I got my first PC and um, then that's all I was pretty much doing after that point. So did you yeah. make any special mixtapes on your on your Sony? Double I was always doing mixtapes. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it wasn't anything particularly special, but yeah, I was always doing mixtapes and doing them for friends too because I had the double deck machine and nobody else had it. So they'd all come over and it's like, oh, can you splice this? Can you do this? It was good fun. Do you have like a song from when you were growing up that you still listen to today and you just you totally like get excited when you hear it? Uh, probably not a specific song, but I remember with my friends, we used to listen to the um, the Dirty Dancing soundtrack when it came out oh, on yeah. tape. And we yeah. just wore that tape out. And we had to re-record it and re-record it and re-record <laughs> it because um, yeah, we just, we'd listen to it all day in, in our rooms. That's awesome. So I, I can always listen to that soundtrack. You know, I don't, I'm going to have to go listen to it. I, I don't, I have to admit, I don't think I've ever really heard it. So I'll put that at the top of my playlist. Yeah. I think it's got a lot of good songs. That's, I mean, that one has, I've had the time of my life on it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. There we go. All right. So I think every developer goes through this where you just hit days or sometimes weeks where you just go through major burnout, right? Like, 
you just kind of look at the code and it sort of blurs over your eyes for a bit there. But what are some things that you do to help you when you are feeling particularly burnt out? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know I have a right answer, but it, it took me a while, maybe even 20 years before I kind of found, found a groove where I don't get into that state. Um, one of the key things is I get some exercise halfway through the day. So I take an hour long break. I either go for a walk or a big long bike ride or something like that. And that's a really good way to, to reset for me. Um, I also now like have more of a balance between work and life where I can actually turn off at the end of the day. Like I force myself um, to, to do that. And I, I guess more specifically, if, if I'm right in the moment where I'm, I'm stuck, I'll actually switch to doing something different. Like I might do some, some tech research or just like just a completely different task, get away from looking at code and do some research, which doesn't help when you've got deadlines. Um, yeah. But that, that's, that's a good way to kind of reset my head. I'll, maybe I'll like, once a month on a Friday afternoon, I might be in that state and I'll say, oh, look, I'll, I'll do some research for the rest of the day and just look at what's new in the tech space and catch up on what's going on. So that, that's kind of the strategies that I have. Nice. Those are good. I think definitely I can relate well to a, a lot of those, just going and kind of connecting with nature, deconnecting from technology, but there's a lot to be said for just stepping away for even five minutes and thinking about something else and then coming back, looking at it with kind of a fresh mind. So definitely agree. Talking to a friend about Star Wars. There you go. <laughs> Jason and I don't know that one at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, and so final question, um, as one of the creators of, and founders of Wallaby JS, what advice can you share with other programmers who have an idea for a library or a tool and are interested in building a company around it? Uh, I'd, I'd probably give two main pieces of advice. I think the first is, Obsess over the user experience and your customers, whether they're paid customers or not. Um, and I think that user experience and customer focus, like you treat people right, you give them a great experience, you're going to have a good outcome. Um, so that, that would be the first piece of advice. And then I think that the second would be um, focus on your MVP, your minimal viable products. Like don't try and build the perfect thing that's completely finished before you get it in front of somebody's eyes, because you may have the, the perfect product that never, never sees any use by anybody or technology has moved on by the time you get a chance to ship it. Um, so for what we're doing, we, we try and ship something. If we've got a new product idea within around about a, you know, two, three month period where we can, it's not always possible. Um, but that's, that's what I, I would, would advise people to try and focus on and and really give it a shot. It's once you get into it, once you get used to the idea of launching a product or a service and um, getting out there in front of people, it's it's not that hard. There is a lot to learn, but it's it's not rocket science. You know, everyone can do it. Um, just give it a shot. Kind of like programming, where you just have to take those first steps, and it's just one one thing after the next. Just taking it little bits at a time. Exactly. Nice. Cool. Really, All right. Oh, I go really ahead. appreciate the MVP advice. I, I think way too many people get stuck in, it needs to be perfect. Okay. Well, on that note, though, as you're talking about Wallaby, let's turn the time over to you and you can, like I said, we're really excited for this. I think we've been really anticipating hearing what you have to share about is your JavaScript and TypeScript test stack holding you back and uh, how we can work through that. Yeah, let me just uh, share my screen. I've got a bit of a presentation and I'll, I'll give a bit of a demo. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so a um, little bit of background about Wallaby before I, I start. So we've um, obviously we're based on the Gold Coast in Australia. We already mentioned that. Um, we've got a number of products across four different editors that we provide. Um, I, I won't talk to all of those. The links are here um, so people can, can check out and, and 
and read about each of those products if you're interested. One that we're particularly excited about at the moment and we've been working on for the last couple of months is uh, Console Ninja. Um, so that's, I think, going to be another, I want to say, revolutionary uh, Wallaby product, but hopefully, um, hopefully that's super useful to people. Uh, so if you're interested in knowing when that becomes available, you can go to the Console Ninja website and, and uh, sign up for uh, early release advice. Um, we're actually hiring. We haven't really advertised this yet anywhere apart from a, a little link on our website, but we're looking for a developer advocate. So if you know somebody or you are a developer advocate and you're interested, um, check out our careers page because um, that, that's definitely a role that we're uh, pretty excited to fill. And overall, as a company, our mission is to create awesome uh, software development tools for other software developers. So we've all, uh, I've been doing that probably since about 2007 um, in some way, shape or form across the various companies that I've worked at. Uh, and, and our whole team has been kind of in that space for a long time. And that's that's what really excites us. So it's a little bit different, a little bit niche in terms of uh, development, but that's what Wallaby as a company is all about. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the topic of, of today's uh, presentation. So, what's the pro the problem with your current uh, testing stack, JavaScript, TypeScript testing stack? So the the first big problem that we see um, and that we've tried to solve with our product is uh, there's disconnected feedback between writing code and running tests. So you write your code in your editor, and then your tests are running either manually or through some sort of terminal in watch mode somewhere else. Um, so the, the, the feedback between writing code and running tests isn't connected. Uh, so that, that's the first problem. Second problem is tests often take a long time to run after you make a change. Um, certainly in the case of um, default karma uh, for Angular testing, your, all of your tests have to re-execute after every single change. Um, some testing frameworks make that a little bit better, but they don't have intricate knowledge about how your tests and your code relate. And so that means that it takes a long time to execute tests after you make a single change. Um, next problem is you need to view special reports if you want to try and understand code coverage for your, for your project. So that's another disconnected feedback problem that you have. And it's also, it, it can also be pretty hard to navigate output in a console window or stack traces and then go back to your editor to try and understand what is failing or what, what the test results are actually telling you. Um, again, that disconnection requires context switching uh, as you go between the editor and the terminal. And in a lot of cases, if you want to debug your tests, it requires a lot of uh, setting up the debugger and ceremony to try and get everything linked together before you can actually start debugging. So that, that's, that's the, the problem as we see it. So how does Wallaby help? Uh, first thing to note is Wallaby works with your existing testing framework. So it's not a testing framework itself, like something like Cypress, for example, for end-to-end uh, for -end testing. Uh, it, it just works with what you've got today. Um, there's nothing special that you really need to do. Uh, what it does is it runs your tests immediately as you type. So it's tightly coupled and integrated with your editor. And as soon as you make any change, even if un unsafe changes, Wallaby will run um, and uh, show you the results right in your editor. Uh, it, it can show you runtime values and errors, but also uh, code coverage and uh, test results. Um, because we're taking tight control of your tests, we actually understand all of the dependencies between your tests and your code, and we only run the minimum set of tests based on your code changes. We also do some special things. Uh, we, we end up parallelizing test execution we're on certain testing frameworks that don't support uh, test uh, execution parallelization. And we've specifically designed Wallaby, there are, there are specific features in our products to work for uh, really large projects as well. Um, and and that's, that's something that we're um, excited uh, to be able to provide to people. So the, the key thing about Wallaby is that it reduces context switching and wait times. Uh, so, Without too much uh, more intro, let's let's dive in and, and take a bit of a look. So I've got a um, a VS Code project uh, over here, and actually before I do that, um, if you want to try out Wallaby, uh, this is our website wallabyjs.com, and if you go to uh, try here, you can download and install. So I said we support various editors, so we've got VS Code, IntelliJ, Visual Studio, Sublime Text. 
Um, so you can use our website and download the extension at the appropriate marketplace for each one of those uh, editors. So once you've got Wallaby installed for VS Code, I've, I've got a, a Angular Tour of Heroes application with some tests. Um, all you need to do is you can say Wallaby JS uh, start. So for 80 to 90% of projects, you don't need to configure anything. Wallaby will start for you automatically. Um, for some projects using older uh, testing frameworks or a little bit bespoke configuration, um, we do have config files that you can use to configure Wallaby. But as I said, for most projects, you don't need to do anything. So once you start Wallaby, um, you'll see a little indicator in the bottom right. You can see a progress bar. Uh, that's Wallaby starting and running your tests. And uh, you can see it's finished running the test, and we've got this test output that's being displayed. And we have a little indicator saying we've got zero failing tests and eight tests that are passing. Uh, if I go into some of the code, so let's have a bit of a look at one of our tests. Let's have a look at the dashboard test. Uh, so we've got our dashboard component spec. Um, you'll see that your editor, if, if you're familiar with VS Code, the editor's changed a little bit. The experience is pretty much the same across all of the editors that we support. So we have these gutter indicators that Wallaby has uh, added on the left-hand side. And you can see all of these gutter indicators are green. And what green means is that Wallaby ran this code and there was no problem with the code. Uh, we have different colored indicators depending upon um, what has happened as your code executed. So in this case, we've got a fresh project, all the tests are fine, all the code executed, everything's green. If I was to, for example, say throw a new error, let's just say something went wrong, uh, you see that the indicators have changed a little bit. Uh, first of all, you'll see we've got uh, this dark, this red color, um, and that is beside our, te our test, so it shows our failing test, and it also shows the specific line of code um, that had the error. Um, and you see that we've, we've also got this pink indicator. And the, the pink indicator means this particular code was executed on the way to an error. So if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see that we have green everywhere else. So it's just this test that's failing. Um, this code was executed on the way to the error, and here's the error itself. You'll see we also have a white indicator. The white indicator shows that this particular line of code was never executed. Now we've, we've got one other color um, that's that's worth uh, talking about a little bit. Oh, I, I should also note that uh, down the bottom we have um, the error being output in the in the Wallaby test output. Uh, so the, the other color that we have is um, is a yellow color, and yellow shows partial execution. So I can I can force us to show this with saying if if false and true, so that the true side of this statement is never going to execute, and I'll just say console log never happened uh there we go ah and i want to get rid of my error because we have our red uh, our pink indicator and so now you can see that we've got this um this orange indicator and the orange indicator says part of this line of code didn't execute and in this case it's the true true part of the line of code didn't execute and wallaby has a command uh, for that so we can say show uncovered oops, so toggle uncovered code regions and it will tell us the this is the code that never actually executed um, as a part of this test. So we can we can toggle that to see what's going on. Um, so I showed you the the test output pane just before. Um, we also have a coverage and test explorer. So I'm just going to follow this link, and um, then what what you have here is a Wallaby what we call Wallaby app. So this is like a high level dashboard. Kind of think of it as a strategic view of your project. Um, to what tests have executed, which tests are failing. So right now, all of our tests are passing. Um, it can You can filter based on various things. You can filter based on names. So if I want to say dashboard, uh, you can see all the dashboard tests. You can see how long each of the tests took to execute. Um, you've got some other filter options at the top here. If we have any logging within a, a test, you'll see the, the logs being output here. So here we can see we've got some, some logging that's being uh, output here. And so this is the test view, and then we have a files view as well. And in the files view, we have this, again, strategic view of our project's coverage. So overall, our project has 40% coverage, and we can see how that rolls up across the various components uh, that are part of our, of our project. So let's, uh, let's 
take a little bit of a look at how Wallaby can help you um, inspecting runtime values uh, as, as you're developing your application. So I've got my dashboard component. And in the dashboard, I have uh, already some console log. And that's what we, we saw in the Wallaby app just before. So here we can see, uh, if we just hover over, um, any console log statements that you put in your code. As your tests run, Wallaby captures those console log statements and shows them in your editor. So here you've got a uh, nice uh, formatted view in the, in the hover. You have the values being displayed in line, which in this particular case, they're a little bit truncated. So that's perhaps not super helpful for us, uh, but we can also uh, go to uh, what we call Wallaby tools. Uh, so in Wallaby tools, I have uh, what's called value explorer. Uh, so in value explorer, we can see we have two values being, or values being logged on two separate lines, line 22 and line 24. And if I expand that, um, you'll see we actually have eight values. Um, and the reason that we have eight values is because there are eight separate tests that are testing this particular path of code. So Wallaby is showing the values for each one of those tests, which in this case are, are the same, but they could uh, very well be different. Um, and the, uh, the final thing that I wanted to show you is we can say show in output inspector. So this is just another way of viewing the same logs, uh, log data. And here you can see, here's that object that we logged and you can see it was logged from the uh, dashboard component should display top heroes. And Wallaby adds these nice uh, code lens um, for you so that you can click on that and go to the test. So here it's taken us uh, straight to the test, uh, top line, uh, top heroes as headline. Um, and uh, you can also um, do, you know, use a, a few other uh, actions like go to the test, go to the code, debug the test, which, which we'll have a look at uh, in a minute. So if I go back to um, back to our code, now using console log to view a runtime value, it's, it's easy, um, but it's probably not always what you wanna do because you don't wanna modify code just to see what's happening at runtime. Uh, so the, the other thing that you can do with, uh, with Wallaby, if I get rid of these values, is you can simply uh, select a value and say show value. And if you say show value, like Wallaby's doing exactly the same thing that it, that it did just before and showing you that value both in Value Explorer and in line. Um, you can also use uh, a copy value command that we have. Uh, so if I copy and paste, you see the values being um, copied to our clipboard for us. And uh, if, if, for example, you wanted, um, you wanted those values to um, persist over time, you could also use uh, our special comment format. So you're not changing the runtime behavior of your code. You, you are still modifying your code, but you could say slash slash question mark and Wallaby will on restart always show this value uh, from this point uh, forward. So this special comment format um, allows you to do uh, some uh, persistent uh, value output when, when uh, Wallaby is running. Um, the... The next thing I probably want to show you guys is what happens when we break a test and how we might debug a test. So here we can see we have our heroes uh, slice. Um, so we're taking from element one to element five, so four elements. Um, I'm going to change this, and I know this is going to break a test. Um, I'm going to change this instead of five, I'm going to change it to six. And so Wallaby's now told us, and we can see our indicators have updated. Wallaby has told us, um, this is on the path to a failure and down the bottom it's it's told us which test is failing so the dashboard component should display four links um so it's ex uh, it's expecting four but we actually got five so let's click on this uh test and again we can see that the nice error has been displayed by wallaby in line so we can see exactly where it's wrong um so what i might want to do is i might want to debug what's going on with my code so i can debug this uh by clicking debug icon. And at this point, Wallaby is actually hiding all of the icons and all of the logged values from any of the other tests. So we're, we're focusing now right on this, this one single test. And uh, I might, go, uh, you, you'll notice, I'm just going to move that out of the way. You'll notice that um, we've got uh, some debug actions uh, that have popped up. 
Now, Wallaby's debugger is a little bit different uh, from a traditional JavaScript debugger. Um, we actually, because we're running in the context of uh, executing a test, we actually capture all of the steps of execution um, that Wallaby knew about when running a test. So that allows you to step forward and backward through your code. Um, you can also uh, simply by highlighting an object. So if I just select uh, a particular variable, so this hero service, it's a Jasmine spy. If I select that value, oh, there we go. Um, Wallaby is also showing us um, the value of the runtime value of that particular variable. So all I have to do is select um, and it will show the value when the debug is running. Uh, so let's uh, let's step forward to our component. So we've got uh, this hero's hero slice one six. So I can choose to run forward to the active line. Uh, that's F5. I can also step into and out and step back into and step out, but let's run forward to the active line and let's see what the value is being assigned. Okay, so I just selected that base. So we can see we have the five elements there, which obviously we're expecting. And let's step into and see what happens next. So if I step into, which is F11, uh, okay, then we're executing some code in the hero search. Let's go back to our dashboard component. I might change this from one, uh, from six back to five. Okay, uh, so now all of our tests are passing and our context is still here, but I can actually step back into, which I think is shift F11, um, and now if I select the value, you'll see that we have uh, four elements and our test is passing again. So that's, uh, that's the Wallaby uh, time travel debugger, uh, super useful for, uh, for debugging your tests. And we, we have this other concept that we released shortly after um, the time travel debugger, which we call uh, test stories. And so if you click on uh, view story, um, what Wallaby is doing using that same mechanism that we would kind of use under the covers to for the time travel debugger, we record all of the steps of execution and we actually show um, show those steps in the test story. So uh, the, the beginning of your test, Wallaby loaded the dashboard component, it ran some imports, um, it ran the describe block so that this, this code actually happened. It didn't execute anything in this test, but it did have to execute the, the it block of, of your tests. Uh, but then finally, when it got to should display four links, uh, it started executing code here. Um, and then it, um, it jumped into a different file, it jumped into a dashboard component, ran through the constructor. Um, then it ran into back into the test for the, uh, for the fixture detect changes. So you can see exactly what was executed like from start to finish in, in this single view. So this, this is also a really good way of trying to understand what code is doing that you may not be super familiar with. Maybe you haven't worked in the application before. Maybe it's been a while uh, since you, you visited the code. So this is a really good way just to understand what's happening from start to finish. And, and the, the grayed out code that you see here is code that we've added just for a bit of extra context so that you understand um, what's happening instead of just the lines of code that executed. But the lines of code that executed are the ones that are, are highlighted, not, not uh, dimmed out. Okay, so I think uh, I didn't want to take up too much time. There's, there are a lot of features in Wallaby um, that I could run through today. Um, we'll see how we're going for time uh, towards the end, and, and maybe I could, I could show a few more features. But I'm going to jump back into our, um, our presentation now. Uh, so uh, let's play from the current slide. So there's some other features to check out. So Wallaby has a, a test profiler that allows you to analyze the performance of a specific test. Um, We've got a number of features that are really handy for working on larger projects. Uh, we have some strategies for improving code coverage uh, that we talk about in our in uh, one of our webinar recordings that we have uh, published on our website. Um, Wallaby includes a number of quick navigation shortcuts. So keyboard shortcuts and commands to quickly navigate to errors. And um, for example, we, we have a problems view in VS Code. So we show uh, errors that are happening in uh, when Wallaby is running your tests, there's problems in VS Code, so you can use the VS Code shortcuts or whatever your editor shortcuts happen to be uh, to quickly navigate uh, to errors. And Wallaby also has first-class support or, or integration for testing frameworks that support snapshot testing. So Wallaby will automatically update your snapshot, report on out-of-date snapshots and so forth um, as, as is relevant. 
Uh, so a couple of resources again hopefully these uh, links would be useful to you in the recording uh, so we we have our website and our docs um, we as i mentioned we've got a free trial available for commercial projects uh, we we also have an open source license so if you've got an open source project uh, you can apply for a free license for wallaby um, our previous webinar recording is is pretty helpful it goes for about an hour i believe that's a great way to cover all the features that wallaby offers uh, and we also have a for VS Code, we have an interactive tutorial uh, in our docs. So uh, Wallaby will actually start and, and guide you through the process of, of learning all of the different features um, with our website. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty much it for today's presentation. Like I said, if we've got more time, I can go through some additional features. Um, but we'll also be on our Discord server. Uh, after today's presentation, and we're, we're generally there uh, during our our day. So if you've got any questions. Uh, go to wallabyjs.com forward slash chat and um, we'll be there to answer questions afterwards. Wow. So um, hopefully, I didn't, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. You, you did perfect. Uh, there were a lot how, of how are we questions. going for, for time? It was, it was perfect, perfect timing. Yeah. You, you're okay, doing, awesome. You're doing awesome. Um, I am pulling up the Q&A right now. Because we had some really good questions while this was going on. Um, so first of all, um, I'm probably going to butcher your name, um, and I'm sorry about that. But I think it's pronounced Deepika, um, and he, um, Deepika wants to know which versions of um, Angular does Wallaby support. So Wallaby was a little bit of background for um, for everyone on some Wallaby technical history. So when Wallaby was first created, um, you always needed a configuration file in order to, to use the product and you would always have to configure Wallaby manually. Uh, so Wallaby works, I think, for Angular all the way back to 1.6, um, but you would have to you'd have to actually create a configuration file uh, for those older versions of, of Wallaby. Uh, but from version 8.2, so Angular 8.2 and above, you don't have to do anything special uh, to configure Wallaby. It should just work automatically with your project. So just install Wallaby, run that Wallaby start command and everything should work for you. Awesome. Yeah, I one thing I want to call out here, and, and I did mention this in the chat, but um, Simon and his company are amazing at support. Um, so before I was even a paying customer, they took a pretty difficult to debug project that was fairly large that I was working on and were able to get the tests running. Um, so yeah, reach out to them. They're, they're amazing. Um, and if, if they can't get it, well, I, I don't know. I've never encountered any situation where they can't get it running. So um, they're, they're willing to help. Um, Absolutely. Eric, um, I want to say Hamaker, Hamaker? Uh, I probably butchered your name, and I'm sorry about that. Um, asks, can Wallaby be a total replacement for existing test runners, Karma, et cetera? And then a follow-up to that one is, it, can it be a test runner on a build server? Um, the answer to that is no. So we, we integrate with existing testing frameworks, but we don't replace uh, existing testing frameworks. So if you have Karma or Jasmine or Jest or B-Test, um, Wallaby will work with those technologies. And so we're not trying to replace what you already have. We want to be a productivity tool that, that sits on top of what you already have. If that makes sense. It does. Um, and, 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 and that's kind of like a good message for potential uh, users of Wallaby as well. There's no vendor lock-in. You don't have to worry about you know, not renewing your license, let's say, and you don't have access to the tools anymore. Like we're not replacing anything that um, you don't already have today. And Katie Learman asks, how big of an app can Wallaby handle? For instance, we have a mono repo with thousands of tests that often give just issues, especially running locally. That's, uh, that's a really good question. And it, it depends on how you want to run your tests. So by default, Wallaby will run all of your tests in your project. If, for example, that um, causes memory issues for your computer, then it doesn't really matter if you're running Wallaby or you're running outside of Wallaby, you're still going to have memory issues. Uh, what Wallaby has is it, it has a number of features 
that allow you to work in really big repos um, without uh, without having to run all of the tests at once. So for example, uh, we've got a feature called Smart Start. And the way Smart Start works is every time you open up a test file, Wallaby will start running the tests for just that file as you've opened it. So if you're working on a particular feature in a mono repo, you don't need to run all of the tests at once, um, just the test that you're working on. So that, that's one option that we have uh, that really helps. We have um, another feature for working in mono repos where you can run just one project that's in that mono repo. So instead of running all of the tests in all the projects, because you're probably working on only one component at a time, um, then then Wallaby can just watch those that that one project. So there, there are a couple of different options there um, that make it pretty easy to work on large repos. But if if you're not sure and you want to see how it performs, um, check it out. See see how it goes with your project. And like Jason said, if you've got a problem and it's not running for you, let us know. We'd be happy to help. And I I use Smart Start quite a bit. Um... So I'll use Smart Start, and um, I like to have the file and my test file open so that I. one of the features you didn't point out is that in VS Code, it will show you the code coverage in the file as you're writing tests also. Um, mm -hmm. So I like to have them side by side, but it narrows the test, like you said, um, and allows me to work in bigger repos much faster. Um, how long is the free trial? Uh, the free trial is 15 days by default, but if you need an extension, just let us know. And that is 100% true. Um, they're, they're a really good company that way. Um, and one last question was, Wallaby is focused on unit testing, right? Yes, that's true. Wallaby can also run certain types of, I guess, more integration tests, depending upon what testing framework that you're using. But I think the benefit of Wallaby comes from that fast feedback loop that it enables. So if you've got long running tests where you're waiting tens of seconds or minutes to get a result, then the benefit of the potentially out of date code indicators and values and everything that you're seeing in Wallaby kind of um, subsides a, a fair bit. So I think that fast feedback loop is, is kind of the sweet spot for, for Wallaby. And if you guys are using Karma, Wallaby, it, it will speed up your, your test writing so much. I, I can't even explain how much faster I am at writing tests with Wallaby. Um, uh, last question, and then I'm going to let Duncan Hunter ask his question. Um, but um, Steve Whitman asks, well, I could let Steve ask this. Steve, you can ask him a question. I see that the one, the initial individual use perpetual license plus a year of updates $135 what's the cost of future years future updates so we we have different discounts for different types of licenses um so the the personal license uh we like to think of as being heavily discounted and even for renewals is is pretty heavily discounted so for a wallaby license and it depends on the on the product as well um because we have a bundled license for wallaby and quokka uh, our other product that we haven't really spoken about today. Um, but for Wallaby only, it's a 50% uh, discount for personal license renewals. Cool. Looks awesome. All right, and and I, sh I, should, I should note as well, I think the FAQ section of our um, ever purchase page um, details what those discounts are. So I was also just going to ask, when did Wallaby start? So the first version of Wallaby was released for IntelliJ editors in 2015. Cool. Um, and then we added support for other editors. I, I think we were one of the first products or first extensions available for VS Code. So we mentioned on the, on the keynote when VS Code was released. Um, and then uh, we released our Quokka product in 2017. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Simon. We really appreciate your, your presentation, your time, and for answering questions for us. And yeah, so if anybody does have any other questions for him, though, what are what are the best ways that people can get in contact with you? Do you want him reaching out through email, through Twitter? 
Look, I think it uh, depends how interactive you want to be. Discord, we're generally during our business hours, we're generally um, available if you if you want to ping us and, and get a fairly quick response. Um, if you've got some sort of issue with the product, you can email us. We've got a GitHub issues repository. Um, yeah, where you you can you can tweet to us if if you want to. Any anything and everything. Uh, there's no real preference. Whatever's easy for uh, for people. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again. And yeah, then, thanks yeah, for having me. Let's uh, let's bring on Duncan. And Chris, I'm going to have you come and sure. uh, we'll introduce Duncan together. But uh, yeah, so Duncan, you are also in Australia, but why don't you explain again? I know this was, we kind of talked about it at the beginning of the meetup, but uh, tell us a little bit more, more about where you're from exactly and what it's like there in your city. Yeah, I, I live in the Blue Mountains, which is about a couple of hours north of Sydney. Oh, well, not north, but um, kind of inland from Sydney. So it's nothing like American mountains. I'll call them more hills compared to mountains in America, but it's a lovely spot. It's kind of a little bit more rural um, and it's an awesome place to live. So yeah, lots of good rock climbing and nature and things like that up here. Awesome. And um, kind of the same thing for you. Like if you were to bring somebody in, or if somebody came in who'd never been to Australia, what's the one thing that you'd like to go and share with them and have them kind of get that first taste and experience of for Australia? I guess it depends how adventurous they are. If they're very adventurous, then I guess I would drag them out to do a canyon or a bushwalk or a rock climb up here in the Blue Mountains. I think it's one of the kind of scenic places that, you know, is home for me. Um, but I guess out of the cities, I think, Walking along the coastline, kind of Bron Bronte to Bondi in Sydney is one of those magic kind of Sydney experiences that's really cool. Nice. Okay. I'll keep that on my list. I'm going to have to like email you and Simon <laughs> and a couple of our, you know, like um, Chris and Craig and just make this list of my Australian and New Zealand adventures. <laughs> yeah, you'll definitely have to come out. Perfect. Okay. Well, I am totally curious if you were to enter a contest, like a non-programming, non-computer related contest, what kind of competition would this be for, do you think? I think it would have to be rock climbing. I don't think I'd win it, but <laughs> I'd probably be the most excited. Um, yeah. So definitely rock climbing. If I have spare time or anything like that, then yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do. But do you do any of the crazy like free climbing or do you always have a rope? I always have a rope. I'm not that yeah, yeah not that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, even with rope, it, it terrifies me. So I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's virtually terrifying. Yeah. 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 Chris, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, I can go ahead. Um, yeah, we have lot, lots of fun questions for you. Um, so if you don't mind sharing, um, what is one of your guilty pleasures that you don't often share with others? Definitely coffee. I live on the same street as my dad who roasts coffee a few times a week. So like I wake up in the morning and there'll be like a little Tupperware container of fresh coffee from some weird country. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, definitely I'm addicted to lots of coffee. Um, definitely my guilty vice for sure. That's amazing though. You just, you live that close to your parents or your dad. Yeah. It's super good. Like I can just walk up the street and, nice. and kind of just walk through the front door. Yeah. It's su yeah. Super lucky. Yeah. And he roasts his own coffee. So how does he go and get the beans from somewhere or. Yeah. So he gets the beans from somewhere called coffee snobs okay. and they ship them to the house and he's got this huge roaster in the garage and he just goes out and roasts coffee beans like a kilo or, or more at a time. So he's always got too much and which is a great problem to have. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so all... well, and the smell, like I, I can't even, oh, like, I love the smell, right. Oh, that'd be awesome. It's well, so cool. good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what, uh, in your opinion, what country provides the best beans if you get some from all over? Good question. Oh, that is a good question. It depends. I think Yemen's probably my favorite. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, but I probably can't even pronounce some of the other countries that he turns up with, like all over the place. Yeah, so Ethiopian's really good. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Okay. Now, kind of along more of the serious minded questions here, what are some things that you do, like if you're learning a new library or a new framework or just something new, something that's out of your comfort zone, maybe you're struggling with it a little bit, it's not coming as naturally as maybe something else. What are some things that you've done that you feel like helps you to kind of break that down and make things more approachable for you? Yeah, for me, if I'm kind of, because it happens a lot, huh? Like we're all learning new libraries so much. So yeah, so even more recently for me, I find I need to find like some good walkthrough tutorials, like something where I can kind of not go onto autopilot, but just feel uncomfortable about not understanding everything from end to end and just step through something a couple of times. For me, I find that really useful. If I if I find myself just not making progress, I tend to flip into that sort of mode and go, okay, I'm just going to forget about feeling confused and awkward right. and and learning something new and just go through the steps a couple of times. And then sooner or later, it starts to click and you're kind of like, okay, the all the black spots are starting to fill in and it makes sense. How long do you usually wait until you maybe reach out to somebody and ask maybe to oh. pair program or... Oh, I'm super annoying with pair programming. Like <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. I tend to reach out to people quite a lot. So we, so we have a thing, you know, between me and one of the main people I work with at the moment all the time, almost every few days, it's like, oh, do you have a minute to be a rubber duck and like just hop on a call and talk it out loud. And as we all know, you kind of tend to solve it just by expressing it. So I find that super useful. Um, it's something that I really appreciate from the team that I get to work with at the moment that everyone's open to that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's such a good bonus to have a good team like that, that you can just learn from each other. It's, you know, it's one of the best ways to learn, in my opinion, just being able to throw a problem at somebody else and get their perspective and, and learn from them. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's fun. It's like getting paid to hang out at work with your mates. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's cool. So, yeah, yeah. It makes such a difference, though, when you have a team that doesn't make you feel like you're dumb or like you're less than, you know, and, and they can just, they're approachable and they get excited just to kind of do that pair, pair programming with you. So mm -hmm. it does, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I think you've got to invest in growing that culture. Like we have a an hour slot each week where we just bring whatever we want to the table because we're always in these conversations about improving how we do something. And it always is like, oh, we, someone should, you know, bring that to the Friday conversation and people just, we just have an open forum and we just run through things that we're all thinking about and, it's kind of a different person each time kind of brings a topic or something. And that's, that's really fun as well. Nice. Really cool. So you're a uh, lead front end engineer. Um, what advice would you give to other developers who are trying to get a promotion or a salary increase, or just trying to, uh, you know, get even just like a junior trying to get into the industry? What, what are some advices that you'd give? I, I think if you're going to be a junior getting into the industry, which we've all been in that position before, um, I think you really, you got to do the miles. You got to hustle and go learn a bunch of stuff, which is super easy these days to jump online and do. But I think you've got to get out there and actually get involved with other developers. So my encouragement would be if you want to crack into the industry, you got to go learn lots of stuff, but you also need to go to user groups and conferences and hackathons and just go find a bunch of developers to be with and sit with. And I think opportunities will come from that. And also you kind of proving if you you know, if you want to be full-time working in that industry and love working with those other developers. So yeah, that, that'd be what I would be pushing for. That's right. good advice. I do want to give you an opportunity here though, because I know that you've created some courses on Pluralsight. So before mm -hmm. I turn it over and have you go into your presentation, do you want to tell everybody more about what you've done there with Plural, Plural Site and how they might be able to find your course courses. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, a bunch of courses on Plural Site um, that you can just check out by going to pluralsite.com, uh, and in particular, a bunch on Angular around testing or around NGRX. We've got a really big, you know, walkthrough with that with Deborah, which um, was lots of fun to make. So yeah, if you're interested in learning more Angular or or NGRX stuff, then jump on Plural Site. Nice. Okay, well, we will turn the time over to you and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Cool. Let me share my screen.
just pull this down. Can everyone see the see my screen there? Not yet. Not yet. There we go. All right. So I'm going to jump over to some slides. So I have a handful of slides and then um, I will uh, drop into some code demo. So I wanted to um, actually start off by saying uh, that consistency and code reuse and maintainability for front end apps, especially in really large companies where I work is freaking hard. Um, we always end up in a similar position uh, where we're chasing the same things. And, and I've worked on you know, lots of front-end applications for the last decade, be it you know, enterprises or startups or, or massive government agencies. Um, so today I wanted to walk through what I've been doing recently in our teams, building micro front-ends using web components and uh, uh, design tokens, and in particular in Angular apps. So I work for a company called Zedware. We're an Aussie consultancy. And at the moment, we're helping the Aussie government build their next generation of design system. And we're doing that with uh, web components. So for us, why web components is pretty much because we want to be able to achieve this on the page. We want to be able to make a, a my dash button component. And we want to be able to make it once in a web component and run that in Angular and in React and in uh, our content management system from Adobe called AEM because we've got lots of different digital assets and we need an ability to be able to get some of this code reuse. But for us, it's not just about being able to get code um, reuse out of our web components. We also want to get some help implementing our micro front ends. So this is something that we do where we would have a uh, content management shell, and we might use a blue web component um, up in the top there. And then we might have an Angular micro front end running in there as feature one that uses the same blue button. And then we have a React feature that might use that same blue button as well. So web components help us not just run in different environments, but run them all on the same page at the same time. Uh, but there's another thing that's really helping us that's been pretty awesome for us as a, as a sets of teams, and that's design tokens. So for example, if someone wanted to change this, you know, blue button here we have in the Angular feature one from, you know, being blue to green, they want to change the primary color. That's normally kind of traditionally been tricky for us and all the different teams is that someone will contact the designers, the designers will say, yeah, here's, here's the value from Figma, or I'll send it to you in a Slack chat. Um, but it's unversioned and it's copy and pasted into lots of different places, not just web, but content management systems and also into the mobile area. And that gets really tricky as we know to manage that copying and pasting. So that's where design tokens, which are just simple key value pairs that we keep in JSON uh, can be really good because you can whack a version on them and you can put them in a package. So here we have just a very simple example of that with a color dash primary token. Uh, set to this blue color with a version on it. And you can just simply update that version, set a new color, and then all those downstream teams um, can get access to that and have a source of truth that they trust. Uh, and for, for us and for most people, it's hard to decide which app should actually be the home for all these style decisions and tokens. So you end up making another repository for it. So we, we do that and we use Style Dictionary, which is a library that allows you to compile out your tokens to different things. So we package them up into NPM and for the web developers, they get the, those tokens as both CSS variables and also SAS variables. So they've got an option to choose what they wanna use. So all the different teams, you know, there's many more than three teams across, you know, even just one of our massive government departments um, that that are doing web apps in different repositories that need access to these style changes. And the same goes for the mobile team. You know, they might need them as Flutter or Android or Swift and iOS and be able to get access to those same versioned um, key value pairs. So this has made a huge difference for us and is something that's, you know, almost as important as the reusable components. So if you go to the Can I Use website, this is kind of interesting and you search for web components, you'll see that you know, Web Components has really snuck up on us in the last couple of years, and we can use them in all the main evergreen browsers. You know, in 2022, most of us probably only need to support these browsers you can see here that are showing green for these standards 
um, in the top left, shadow DOM, custom elements and HTML templates. So it's, it's kind of, you know, we've reached a time where it's normal to use web components. It's not too difficult. But ironically, none of us actually write um, vanilla JavaScript to, to make our web components. We all end up using a library still. Uh, and we use Stencil.js from the Ionic team, which I'm a huge fan of. It's super awesome. And mainly we use, you know, a library for this because we want to write more library-like code versus verbose kind of vanilla JavaScript and get some other helpers, which I'll talk about. So here you can see what would, is a very stereotypical stencil component. At the top, you've got, you know, a, a component decorator that sets up the tag and the pointer to the CSS file and setting shadow DOM to true, which I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, and then we have an, another decorator for a, a, an at prop here for the first name. And that's very Angular-like, but then at the bottom we return uh, TSX, which is kind of React-like, um, and then we're using that first name property. So it's pretty simple to learn Stencil. Um, you could learn it in a couple of days if you're coming from another framework, uh, but there's other cool things that Stencil do for you. And one of the in particular is helping you go from writing a component to actually bundling that up into JavaScript, but not just bundling it into JavaScript, but wrapping Angular versions of it and React versions of it. So I'll show you some of this in code in a second, but this is all of the kind of metadata you need to write uh, or config for Stencil to say, hey, can you take all these web components that I've written in Stencil and can you wrap them in Angular components so I can get you know, all of the Angular experience that I'd be expecting. So the biggest difference though that I've found um, switching from being doing a lot of Angular and other frameworks um, is Shadow DOM. And Shadow DOM, as you can see in this picture here, basically is a, a subtree of the DOM that is the HTML DOM that's inside of your web component. And this is awesome because you get this natural encapsulation for CSS and some of your JavaScript but it also has quite a large learning curve as you get right down into the details and get closer to the metal of using Shadow DOM day to day in terms of things like accessibility and uh, event management and uh, sharing styles. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about the challenges around Shadow DOM. It is awesome, but it's definitely that thing that's you know a, a big steep step up and learning curve as you're coming from just doing normal component libraries or frameworks like Angular. And if you were to run this component that we were showing before, this stencil component in the browser, this is what it would look like. You would have this in this red box here, this shadow root. And in the dev tools, you can see this little div and that would be your DOM, your shadow DOM. Uh, and all the CSS in there and, and the JavaScript's mostly encapsulated by default um, in the way that the web standard works. Uh, and that's great, but often you wanna share styles across a lot of these components. And that's where CSS variables or properties, which are another web standard, it's one of the coolest things about working uh, with web components is that you spend a lot more time just dealing with web standards, um, is you can have a, a custom variable like this dash dash color primary, uh, and then these can naturally cross the shadow DOM. So if you're going to be doing a lot of web components, you'll likely find that you do a lot of CSS variables and probably a lot of the people here are already, you know, heavily using CSS variables um, or SAS variables. And for us, this is our main API surface. We don't use a bootstrap or a tailwind. Um, our components have a theme file with a bunch of these CSS variables for people to set. And each component has a handful of uh, documented um, CSS variables that people can be aware of that can help them get into that shadow DOM and set the styles. So it come, becomes very much our API documentation for how we deal with um, CSS and, and you know, styling across all these components. So I'm gonna jump over into a code demo um, for the next 10 minutes or so. And what I have, is an example of how we've solved most of the problems we've had to decide on in our teams to, to build a set of components in Stencil that we can output to Angular and React and other places. And this isn't actually our real code because that's in a source, we're not open sourced it yet, um, but pretty much all the big decisions we've had to make are here. So if you have a look on the directory on the right, what you'll see is that we have a really simple um, NPM workspace. We have a couple of packages in here um, 
that we publish to NPM, which is our core library, which is where we write all of our web components and stencil. And then we have a core Angular, which is mostly dynamically generated. And I'll show you that running in a sec, where it just basically wraps all of the core web components in Angular so that we can use it in Angular. And we really enjoy using NPM workspaces. We, we're a big NX shop, um, but we just found that for dealing with just packages and keeping things simple, that NPM workspaces work really well for us. Uh, and if we dive in a little more into this core folder, it's going to look very much like a stereotypical stencil kind of project. We have some stencil config. We have a source folder with our components. And if I open up this stencil config, you can see here in this config object, we have some output targets and we're saying we want to output just a generic set of JavaScript bundles, uh, but also we want to output an Angular target. And in that Angular target, we want you to wrap all the components and we want you to wrap them and stick them inside of this core Angular package that we're going to publish to uh, NPM to consume. So Stencil really helps here, does a whole bunch of work setting up um, all of the, the wrapping for you and it's super easy and also extra things like value control accesses for your reactive forms which I'll show you in a second. So that's another one of those awesome things that comes out of Stencil. Uh, if we pop back over and we start diving into the source folder we can see here we have a components folder and we only have two components in here a my button and a my input and if we look down lower we have a theme file so styling and deciding how to make your tokens and how to theme all these components is, is something that takes a bit of time to decide for your team. But the approach we ended up taking is having a theme file. There will obviously be a lot more in there than what you see here, but this is just an example. So we have uh, a focus ring outline here and a focus ring outline offset. So all of the components, including the button and the input here, will have the same theme just set by these two spots to be able to be applied. So everything has the same uh, theme in terms of focusing on a button and you get the same focus ring. So that would be applied to lots of different things like disabled or border outlines or font sizes and all those sorts of things that are used in multiple components. We use this theme file. And if I was to pop back up uh, our directory here into our my input component, you'll see that it looks very much similar to a standard sort of component library that you'd be used to. We have a test folder with end-to-end -end tests and uh, unit tests, but I won't go into too much detail on those, um, except to say that it's a pleasure to use Wallaby to write them. Um, and then underneath here, we have a separate CSS file. And if we open this CSS file, you can see that we're consuming these theme CSS variables that I just showed you in the theme file, this my theme focus ring and my theme focus ring outline offset and deciding on a strategy on how you're going to, you know, design all your tokens and set them up and have this reusable themes across your components is something that takes a bit of time. And this is what we've settled on and we find it quite intuitive and works quite well for us as we're scaling up. If we then look back at the directory here on the right, we use Storybook for everything. We don't have an index.html page. We don't have a web server. There's no way to plonk a component on and look at it. We do everything in Storybook, including our documentation. So we do this in MDX, which is a mix of Markdown and JavaScript components for us. And what's really cool about this, if I open it up, you can see down here at the bottom, we bring in this readme file that Stencil makes and we just plop it at the bottom. So this readme file for each of the components, Stencil will read through and make an auto-generated kind of API documentation for your component of all the properties, events, and everything else you mark up, um, which is really cool. So we just have a bunch of kind of storybook stories, which I'll show you in a second, and custom documentation. And then at the bottom, we have kind of our API documentation and it works quite nice. Uh, so that's our MDX stories. And then if we jump into our actual My Input component, it's going to look very similar to the one I showed you on the slide. Um, we have some metadata. If you want to use this, you'd use the My-Input element. Um, and then we take in a property of value. And then at the bottom here, we return a native input. 
So you got to remember this is inside of Shadow DOM. So they're not going to, the consumers don't necessarily have direct access to this input element. So we've wrapped it in this web component so we can set the value onto the value property, but also we can listen to the, the events that are coming off this input. And then we can, in our private on input handler here, reset the value and emit a change event. So this is a very pretty stereotypical, there's not much in here yet. You would end up having a lot more code as you bake out your components to be able to handle all the things that you want to do, like have prefixes and suffixes and you know buttons and accessibility and so forth. But I think this gives you an insight into you know how it would look. And if I want to run this, I just run npm start. And npm start in the terminal here is just going to run both stencil and also a storybook. So if I pop back over to the browser, this is storybook running and we use it for everything as I was saying. So we've got a my button component over here and you can see that styling, that terrible blue color that I've set um, on this focus ring. And it's the exact same as it is on the input. And that's what we're really chasing is this consistent styling. And this is running the JavaScript version of the web components. I'll show you it running in Angular in just a sec. But Storybook's awesome. I could talk about it for ages. It's amazing. Um, you can come down here and you could set some values and you can configure all of your different stories. No one would end up with like 10 stories for each component. And then there's a docs tab and inside of here is that markdown or MDX I was talking about. So there's a mix of interactive stories. Devs can look at the code for it and then they can see our API surface underneath. So this is you know, exactly how we do our documenting. We actually at the moment send everybody here um, in our internal teams when they want to use our components versus having a pure documentation site just yet. Um, and it works quite well for us. So I'm going to pop back over into the code and I'm going to kill a storybook and clear out our terminal and just close this for a second. And where, what I want to show you next and finally is, well, we've written these stencil components. How do I then take this and package it up and all the different Angular teams can then consume it? So I showed you the stencil config that will be listening for a build and we'll wrap them. So let's just make a change here so we can see that working in our change tree. So I'm just going to give this event emitter a type just to make some sort of change. So I'm going to call it, say that, this emits a value property and that a value property is of type string. So now that we've done that, if I was to open the terminal again, I could run npm run build. And what this is going to do is two things. Uh, sorry, it's npm run build all. This will run stencil. Stencil will build all the JavaScript modules. Then it's going to make the Angular wrappers. And then there's a second build step where we take all those Angular wrappers and bundle them up with ng packager. And you can look through this code later, I'll share it. And there's lots of good docs from Stencil on this. Uh, but basically, if we come over into the right again and we look here at the um, output, just going to collapse this so it's a bit clearer. We've got our packages folder and we've made a change to our core package. But our core Angular package now has gone and built itself and we have a dist folder and it's this dist folder with all of these different module formats in an Angular specific way that we publish to NPM that the Angular consumers can pick up. So I've already gone and done that and I have another repository. I'm just going to jump over to it. This is a different instance of VS Code and it's just, let me open the side here. As you can see, it's just, you know, the most hello world Angular app you could make. And I've gone over into the package JSON and I've said, I want to NPM install our core package that we just were looking at that has all our stencil components, which are now just web components. And I want to also uh, import our core Angular package, which has all the wrappers. So once I've done that, it's pretty easy for teams to consume these. They just come over to their app module and they can just install the um, Sensor demo module that we made is part of our core Angular package here. And that's pretty much mostly all you need to do. This um, has already been made by Stencil. It works great, does all the lazy loading, sets everything up for you. You don't have to think too hard about any of that stuff. It's just mostly done um, out of the box. The only other thing you need to do is reach into the core package and grab this function that Stencil will make which basically just registers all your web components with the browser. So as you can see, it's pretty simple. If you had multiple Angular apps um, 
and multiple teams in different repositories, depending on your strategy, uh, they can then just do this and they have access to all of these shared components and styles. When you want to use them in HTML, well, it feels very much just normal. You would have a my dash input component and a my dash button component. And I'm just wrapping these inside of a reactive form. And out of the box, I registered some control value accesses um, in Angular to be able to listen the, to the events that come off this my dash input. So this doesn't emit a change event, it emits a custom event called my change, um, which would be your business name at the front, not my, but my change. And then that just naturally gets picked up by Angular and works as the developer who uses this would expect. But we get the ability to have all the goodness in this component that we would want for accessibility and styles and all sorts of different things to be able to manage um, a custom component. And here you can see us listening to another custom event with the click, my click, and then we can call the submit method on the component class. And then at the bottom here, we just pumping out the raw value of the form just so we can see it working. So it's pretty simple and pretty intuitive once you actually get to the point. There's a lot of work to get to this point, but once the developer consumes it, it's not too foreign to them at all to deal with these web components in Angular. So if I pop over to the browser, this is the very vanilla Angular components running in Angular. And you can see the styling. We only have this blue border, but it's exactly the same. It looks exactly the same as it did in Storybook running vanilla JavaScript as it does here with these focus rings in Angular. And if I was to use it, then it's going to bind and work just like Angular would with the normal input element and a reactive form. So that's quite a whirlwind. I know we've kind of zoomed around um, and had a look end to end at stencil and, and design tokens and, and how do you get it published in, in, into Angular. Um, so I'm going to stop at that point um, and just say thanks for letting me share my story. It's a very exciting space and there's lots of cool toys and tools in here to use um, that have been very different than the day-to-day -day Angular work. Um, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Duncan. My mind is blown. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, you know, seeing that a lot of times in enterprise where you build an app and then, yeah, it's, it's outdated and you got to move on to something else. And, you know, this is definitely a way to kind of future proof uh, at least parts of your app that you can make reusable and reuse if you want to switch to React or something else. So uh, it's really cool to see that. Um, yeah. I did have a few questions. So Ty asked, um, he's in a situation at work. Um, he's running uh, micro front ends, design tokens, and implementing a new component library using a micro front end Angular library exposed via routing module with module federation. Um, I believe if we use Angular elements to turn the components into web components, we would uh, this would allow us to use any framework. Um, any advice? Um, and I guess that kind of goes along with uh, Angular Elements versus Stencil in a way. I guess Angular Elements kind of does the same thing. Is that the case? Yeah, or... yeah. I haven't used Angular Elements. It would be great um, to see someone come give a talk here to us all about Angular Elements. I'd love to see it because I haven't really dived in. I know that there's a there's really about five or six big players in this space of web components, and two of them is Lit Element and Stencil. Um, and there's a lot in web components and having a library that is up to date and always moving. And there's a lot more than just making a web component as you saw with the bundling and everything else and having um, Angular wrappers and React wrappers and unit tests. And so we went with Stencil just because it's one of the two big players uh, and we're super happy with it. So I think I'll do my homework with Angular elements and make sure it ticks all your boxes um, and works with your flow um, and do a bit of due diligence. And I'll probably look at Stencil and Lit in that due diligence. Um, but yeah, you, I think make sure you choose something that's got a, a strong kind of community behind it. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then someone else, oh, it was Jason asked, um, have you used this with standalone components at all? With the new, uh, I know it's kind of in a beta. No, right now, not but... yet. I know okay. our team is super frothy, excited to do it. Um, and we've got <laughs> some new projects coming up, um, but not yet. So okay. hopefully no no hiccups there. Hopefully it just works as, as per expected. Yeah, I believe they're taking it out of developer preview for Angular 15 is what I've seen on Twitter. Um, I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool new feature. Mm -hmm, definitely. 
And uh, Ty again also asked, um, is your NX generator plugin published NX plugins? So this one isn't using NX, we're just using NPM workspaces. Um, so we tried using NX and it was great and we got we got it working and we had two proof of concepts um, late last year to decide. And we went with the simpler approach of just NPM workspaces. Um, but Stencil have some really good examples of using NX to generate all this stuff as well. And I think there's definitely some perks to NX, like the testing harness and you know Cypress being baked in and a lot of other goodness that's worth having a look at. Um, but we went the simple approach, but I'll share our repo afterwards um, if people are interested in seeing how the NPM workspaces works. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we also had a message or a, a comment, a question in the comments uh, from Steve. Um, when using Stencil web components in Angular, are there any surprises that you run into that were more difficult than you expected or not, practic not practically possible? Oh, good question. I think we're still at the early days of this. You know, we, start, we kicked off late last year. Um, so there's definitely little quirks like slot change detection um, that you need, you'll kind of discover where you, let's just take you have an ng if, and you're passing into a slot in your web component, the error of a form, because you want someone to have that flexibility that you will need to do something to listen to that change inside of your web component and then re-render that component. So there's little quirks like that, that we find. So we actually have an NX app, funny enough, we call our playground internally, we don't publish it. And we have a React and an Angular app in there. And we just go in there as part of saying our definition of done and just play with these components in Angular and React. So yeah, there's lots of little quirks that you find, but there's nothing ever that's been a showstopper for us, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely something I want to play around with. Um, all right, so I don't think we have any other questions for you. Um, uh, Brooke, should we, uh, is there anything else we want to say before we move on to prizes? I think we're ready for prizes, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, let's let's do make sure. Duncan, do you have a preferred way for if anybody wants to reach out to you or connect? Twitter, email? Yep, Twitter is easy enough um, at Dunk Hunter. Um, or you can grab me on LinkedIn at Duncan Dash Hunter. Um, yeah, always happy to chat, especially in this space. It's a smaller niche than Angular. So if anyone wants to collaborate and talk about experiences, always happy to chat. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Duncan, thank you, Simon. We really appreciate both of you. And then, yeah, let's get into these prizes. So again, we do have the STG $50 Amazon gift card and then the uh, Brebug t-shirt and gift card package. So uh, <laughs> I love this. I love Brooke, Chris. Yeah. We also have Wallaby. Uh, well, I will have to double check with Simon on that. I oh. look, in, look in Slack because... Oh, we only yeah. had two months worth of that, so I'm not sure. Okay, we, we can um, give you we can give you more wallabies for sure. No, no okay, worries. Okay, okay. I didn't want to like <laughs> overstep boundaries, but okay, perfect. I, so then, I'm sorry, I should have looked at my Slack book. No, that's okay. So then, great. We can add in. We'll we'll throw in a couple of those as well. And I thank you, Chris, for creating this amazing wheel of like a hundred <laughs> names. <laughs> so, uh. Again, though, just that quick reminder that if you are given the Brie Bug prize, we can't give that outside of the U.S. So I think actually what we'll do, why don't we start with that one? And then yeah. if we okay. spin your name and you are outside of the U.S., we will give you one of the Wallaby subscriptions since that doesn't matter where you are. So let's do that. Okay. Sounds good. All right, first spin of the night. Also, if you've won a prize in like the last six months, we'll we'll give your prize to somebody else in that case too. But I don't think Scott has won, so awesome. Scott, are you in the US? Let's see what he says. I'm I'm assuming so, but excellent. Okay. Right. So then um, co-organizers will you help me take down their names and what prize they win and Scott will you please message us uh, you can either get us at angular community meetup 
at gmail.com or you can just reach out to us on our Twitter either way, but make sure to do that in the next day or so, so that we can make, you know, know that, that you're interested. Um, if not, we'll kind of default the price of a runner up, but yeah, let us know in the next couple of days. All right. Congratulations. So um, next we're giving away the uh, SDG gift card. $50. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. All right. And you can use it to uh, buy a wallaby. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, Rogelio, I'm Rogelio. He's he's won a handful of prizes from us. I'm actually <laughs> going to default to another. All right, he's got like the yeah. best luck in the world, Rogelio. <laughs> he needs to be playing the lottery. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> hey, Rogelio, if you ever go to Vegas, let me know. Right. <laughs> All right, and sad. Yeah. So same thing. Let us let us mm -hmm. know either through email or Twitter, and we will get you your gift card. Yeah, and this one did not have to be in the U.S., right? This I don't think so. Okay, yeah, I don't think great. So. All right. Hey, okay, so um, Wallaby. Wallaby. We need to have music. Remind me that next right? time. Everybody. We need to have music. <laughs> Now, John, have John. you won anything? I know he's always I know he's on a lot, it, but yeah, he's on a lot. I don't know if he's won. I think he has won a few things. We you can sing. Can sing. Okay, <laughs> I I nominate that Jason will sing. That's a great idea, Rosario. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing. Okay, thank you, John. I think he has right, won thank a couple you. things before, so. All right, back for Wallaby. Jason, I'm waiting for your song. My song? <laughs> Maki, is that correct? Maki Mano, yeah. Okay. All right, congratulations. And then That's a really cool prize. One. What's that, sorry? So that's a really cool prize. So we're, we're doing one more Wallaby? Yeah. All right. Hope. Nice. Oh, that was close. Oh, I was that close. <laughs> so, yeah, Almost congratulations. Hope. Yeah, <laughs> I know I've done that before and it lands like mm -hmm. right on the edge. Yeah. I think so, yeah, uh, Rogelio and John need to go like apply. I don't know if you apply to it or you just show up, but they need to do like the price is right as well. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. That would actually be really fun. But okay. Well, everybody, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate everybody's support. Again, thank you to our speakers. What amazing presentations they were. And we really appreciate everything. And don't forget about our first ever. So we have two events in October. Our first ever Spanish speaking event is on the 11th, 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And then we'll have our next English speaking event. And this will be actually a really a different format than we've ever done before. So I'm excited for this as well. And that's on the what day is it? October 25th that one is actually also at 11 a.m to 1 p.m mountain standard and what we're doing for this one everybody is we're not going to have normal like presentation talks like we normally do but we've actually invited stg who we we uh, were introducing there at the beginning of the event tonight and we're going to have a panel of their experts as well as um, Spivey from Cisco, who's just like this hiring, I, I don't even know what you call him. Like he's just a hiring machine. They've gone through a real series here of hiring a lot of developers and he's become really experienced and practiced at 
how to go through the interviewing process. And STG being a consulting company is also very familiar with how to best present yourself. You know, what, what are things that you should be asking like during the interview in return? Um, what are things that you need to be prepared with? Those kinds of things. So if you're going through the interview process yourself or even not, because really like, let's face it, you should always be prepared for an interview. You never know what opportunity is around the corner. You should always be keeping up on those skills. We really invite you to come hang out with us for that event and ask your questions. We've come up with a set of questions ourselves, but we will definitely be opening up the floor to having attendee submitted questions as well. So it's a great opportunity for you to come level up your interviewing skills get some questions answered. And again, we'll have prizes at that, that event as well. So we'll look forward to that. But yeah, two events in October. Uh, we'll hope to see you at both. But otherwise, thanks everybody for coming tonight. We really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of the week. It, it looks, like, uh, looks like our good friend, um, Rudy View Chris, threw together uh, a stencil generator at oh, NXT nice. stencil. So... There we go. Oh, no, not Chris. Okay. He's not, it wasn't his, but he found one that does um, okay. a stencil generator. So that thank you, Chris. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Hi. See you guys. Thank you.